So, uh, welcome to the next part. We're now going to look at the Keynesian aggregate supply line. Now this is a little bit different. The previous curves we were looking at, ADAS, were neoclassical, based on different assumptions about the macroeconomy to Keynes. Keynes argued that there was no difference between the long run and the, the short run in terms of aggregate supply. So he argues that um, we have an aggregate supply line that looks like this. We start off with a perfectly horizontal, perfectly elastic aggregate supply line um, up to this point Y1. Um, and that's because there's loads of spare capacity in the economy. If aggregate demand increases, okay, say we shift from AD1 to AD2, then guess what? There's going to be no change to the rate of inflation to a price level. So up to this point, the aggregate supply line is perfectly elastic. Okay. So aggregate demand can increase, and there's going to be no trade-off, there's going to be no change to price level, there's going to be no inflation, but output will go up. Um, say from Y1, we have Y1 uh, to Y2. Right. However, in the next stage, between Y2 and YFE, this is the full employment level of output here, that's equivalent to um, the aggregate demand for workers equaling the aggregate supply of workers in the economy. Um, with only a few people between jobs, if you look up unemployment, a little bit of friction on unemployment. So this is the full employment level of income, similar to the potential output on the PPF. Um, if aggregate demand increases, okay, say to AD3 and then to AD4, okay, what's going to happen as a trade-off? is inflation is going to begin to increase uh, because this aggregate supply line becomes increasingly inelastic. Uh, and the reason for this is shortages and uh, bottlenecks will occur in the economy. So um, as, as aggregate demand increases in some parts of the country, there might be a shortage of building workers, they'll demand higher wages, um, there'll be shortages of capital, well, so costs will start to increase, okay, and shortages will begin to occur, and, and therefore there will be some inflation taking place. So aggregate, as we move to aggregate demand free, the, the, the price level will increase a little bit, and output, yes, increases to Y3, uh, but the price level moves from P1 to P2. And then as we move further up, say to this point here, um, at AD4, then we end up at full employment, okay? But we do end up with more inflation at P3. And furthermore, we have this part here, which is perfectly inelastic. So an aggregate demand increases further to aggregate to 85. What we're going to end up here is even more inflation because aggregate supplies become perfectly vertical, okay? Uh, it's become perfectly inelastic because we're at full employment. We can't increase output anymore, um, according to the Keynesian model. So we simply end up with more inflation once aggregate demand shifts to the right of AD4. Um, and the point of this model in many ways is, um, from a Keynesian point of view, elasticity of AS is a, is a very important consideration. So if you have a huge negative output gap, and you're at point A, then it's perfectly fine to increase aggregate demand because you're not going to end up with more inflation. But if you were, say, at point B here, with no negative output gap in the economy, then you're simply going to end up with inflation in the economy. So this is a very useful model when you come to some examples and you're discussing whether it's wise for a government, say, to re have a reflationary fiscal policy or is it wise to have a reflationary monetary policy? It depends where you are on the aggregate supply curve. So I hope that's useful. Um, it's useful to have an aggregate, um, a Keynesian model as opposed to the, neo, uh, the, the neoclassical model. Um, it's also important to bear in mind we can get stuck unless the government intervenes below full, below full employment aid level income. And this is what Keynes warned that the economy can, in the long run, end up at point A, and it won't naturally correct itself, as we saw with the neoclassical model, 
and go back to potential output. And again, this is a very fruitful thing to evaluate in the exam, depending on the question. Thanks a lot.